Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, was north of 60 this week. He's toured communities impacted by wildfire and helped announce an affordable housing project. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs was there. <laughs> Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Yellowknife Northwest Territories. He was joined by territorial and municipal leaders to announce a new 50-unit affordable housing complex to be move-in ready by 2025. It will include a mix of bachelor suites for seniors and singles and two-bedroom apartments for small families. Thank you to the Government of Canada for investing $20.8 million under the CMHC Rapid CMHC Housing Program. The federal Rapid Housing Initiative is funding the project, while territorial subsidies and the city are providing the land. The PM says the North has been facing challenges to build homes, including higher costs, sourcing and transporting materials, and fewer laborers. The stop in Yellowknife is part of Trudeau's two-day tour in the NWT. Yesterday, he visited South Slave communities ravaged by wildfires. The devastation that we saw, people who uh, you know, build homes in a community for over decades, uh, losing just about everything, uh, is truly heartbreaking. But in my conversations with, uh, uh, with Michael Damour, the mayor, my conversations with the premier and with uh, other uh, local representatives and leaders, uh, including uh, KFN First Nation, uh, we are there. Trudeau also faced questions on whether more funds for northern infrastructure would flow after this year's wildfire evacuations. Should the need to build back better, knowing the climate change means there will be more extreme weather events. There will be more wildfires and floods and challenges faced uh, by people across this region. And that's why uh, we are working together to make sure uh, that we are better ready in the future for things that are going to become more and more commonplace. We must. Make Premier Carolyn Cochran says the territories have asked for more support over the wildfire season. We need stronger communication systems. We need more uh, more uh, transportation out, more highways. Uh, there's, I've never seen in my time in politics a highway getting built in one season. So I think, yes, that there is going to be uh, uh, more crises faced before we get the necessary infrastructure. But that doesn't stop us from starting. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, EPTN National News, Yellowknife. To Saskatchewan, where the trial of a woman accused of causing the death of a nine-year-old girl began this week in Saskatoon. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations came out in support of the girl's family. Bailey Maurice was crossing the street with a scooter at a crosswalk when she was struck by a vehicle the morning of September 9th, 2021. The driver, 28-year-old Taylor Kennedy, is in a Saskatoon court facing an impaired driving charge, uh, impaired driving causing death charge after she admitted to consuming cannabis and other substances 24 hours prior to the incident. None of the allegations have been proven. A gathering was held at the provincial courthouse where third vice chief of the FSIN, Ali Bear, spoke to the crowd. It's been a long few days. Um, most of the witnesses are police officers and a lot of them are speaking very highly of the offender. There needs to be some justice for that life that was taken. And the colonial system, the colonial justice system needs to abide by their own laws. And they need to show us that her life mattered. Still in Saskatchewan, where the government revealed an action plan last week to address homelessness and addictions in the province. The province announced an investment of $40.2 million over the next two years to create 155 supportive housing spaces, 120 new permanent emergency wellness centers, and 30 new emergency wellness shelters for complex needs. Another $49.4 million will be invested over five years to create 500 new addictions treatment spaces and a more responsive central intake system. Chief Mark Arcand is with the Saskatoon Tribal Council, one of the organizations running the treatment programs. He welcomed the funding. 
I want to be part of this because I think Indigenous led, you can see the results that I'm showing, is making a difference in our city. We know how to respond to our people uh, because our people trust us. And I think at the end of the day, if we keep being accountable and transparent, we should be able to make some headway, but we need that investment. A violent assault last month in Lac Simon First Nation in Quebec forced the community to implement a curfew for youth. In an effort to stem the violence and vandalism plaguing the territory, Maricela Amador has the details. It is the third curfew in three years for the youth of Lac Simon, where 70% of the population is under 30. Chief Lucien Wabananik of the Lac Simon Anishinaabe Nation Council said that violence and crime have intensified over the last few months. He cited multiple factors for this, including the evacuation of the community because of wildfires, a housing crisis, and the pandemic. On veut bien faire les choses, mais on manque beaucoup, beaucoup de ressources. C'est vraiment à ce niveau-là là, que qu un manque important. On manque de ressources humaines, on manque de, de financement. Between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m., youth under 18 must remain indoors. Since the curfew went into effect, volunteer security guards, recognized by local police, have been patrolling the streets. Pour le moment, c'est vraiment la sécurité. Uh, de, de nos gens, de nos aînés, uh, y a une crainte uh, de se promener même le soir maintenant. Hein? De, si on on l'entend ça. Community member Micheline Anishnapeo, who works in outreach at the local schools, said that people demanded action by the band council. She added that despite the curfew, some youths are still out at night until they are apprehended and brought back home. Quand je rencontre des enfants, ils s'expriment pas. De la, de, du vandalisme qu'ils font. Ils ne savent pas pourquoi ils font ça. Parce que hier, j'étais témoin de ça, puis là, ils disaient, je ne sais pas, je ne sais pas. She said that after the school day is over, the youth have nowhere to go, so they roam the streets. Euh, ici, dans la communauté, on n'a pas, euh, pas de maison des jeunes, il n'y a pas assez d'activités euh, pour les jeunes. On n'a pas, pas de ça dans la communauté, puis comme je t'ai dit, on a plus de 800 à 900 jeunes, moins de 18 ans dans la communauté. APTN spoke with a few youths in front of the local high school who said that they did not mind the curfew. Lena Jane Gunn, a mother of young children, said that she supported the curfew, but that more solutions are needed. Je ne sais pas, peut-être encadrer les enfants, puis garder les enfants au sport. Chief Wabananik emphasized that parents also have to do their part. Otherwise, the band council may involve youth protection and even consider banishment from the community for repeat offenders. Donc, on a un problème aussi au niveau policier, au niveau de l'effectif. On manque de policiers dans la communauté. Ça, c'est un autre enjeu qu'on doit régler avec les gouvernements rapidement. APTN contacted Indigenous Service Canada, but did not hear back in time for broadcast. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Lac Simon, Quebec. Residential school survivors in the Northwest Territories are deciding on the future of the structures they attended. That story and more, still to come. school at the Sturgeon Lake First Nation near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan has a land-based education program for its kindergarten to grade 12 students. The program is aimed at getting back the old Nehiyal uh, traditions that were taken from the community by colonization and residential schools. Brent McGilvery has this story. Our young people being taken away from, from their homes to these residential schools as children. They lost their identity. They lost their culture. We didn't have this. Tanya McCollum takes this man's words to heart. She is a K-12 teacher at the Sturgeon Lake First Nation Central School, a school with more than 400 students. She started with the land-based curriculum six years ago bringing with her extensive knowledge in academics and her lifelong experience on the land. I was raised by my grandparents right from an infant. So the first few years of my life was uh, out on the land. So it was informal education. So a lot of things that, uh, uh, that I know how to do was observing my grandmother or my grandfather. You know, my grandmother 
was the product of the Indian residential school system. So she was very quiet. She didn't like to talk because that's, uh, that's um, trauma from the residential schools. Tanya's teaching combines Nieho and Western knowledge and a healthy helping of food sovereignty. My education is based on the Western ways of doing things and the indigenous ways of doing things. So weaving those two together makes it even stronger. And that's what we try and do at our school is we try and uh, not one worldview is the way. Introducing the students to food that comes from the land, the education is taught inside and outside the classroom. When we first started cutting meat or pulling out fish from the lake, they were all grossed out and um, that's changed. The students are taught how to identify plants and animals and how local hunters bring meat to the school. They're starting to realize that uh, land and the food um, are the core of what we are as indigenous people and they've had great respect for, um, for the animals and the plants. When we talk about um, working from a land-based paradigm and when we start talking about food sovereignty, that uh, certain plants and animals, um, they have to have that spiritual connection. Not only is Tanya busy teaching inside and out of the classroom, she does the same on Facebook for everyone to access and learn from. Many uh, non-Indigenous people are my followers. You know, they ask me questions and it's good in a way because uh, they know about our way of life and they want to know more. And then when, when they learn about our culture, there's, um, it mitigates racism. So um, I think uh, with reconciliation, um, I think land-based is the way to go when we want to indigenize our curriculums. Land-based is one of the ways. Leonard Ermine and other local elders visit the school once a week. They share their knowledge with the students of the ways that were taken away from them when they were forced into residential schools. Leonard says the elders feel very fortunate to have Tanya and traditional knowledge being brought back. With the truth and reconciliation, we're beginning going back. We say, escape not soon, like what this woman is doing. We're going back to Mother Earth, going back to the old ways that our people had not lived, the way our people took care of us, the way our people fed us. These are things that matter. Brent McGillivray, APTN National News, Sturgeon Lake First Nation, Saskatchewan. The University of Winnipeg is equipping the next generation of Indigenous language teachers with a new virtual program. The program is called Teaching Indigenous Languages for Vitali Vitality Certificate. It gives speakers of Indigenous languages the requirement to teach their own language and create future programs. The certificate's 10 courses are taught in English and applicable to any Indigenous language. Heather Suter is an assistant professor and Machif speaker. She co-developed the program. Our language is critically endangered as many, I should say, you know, many indigenous languages across Canada, North America, and around the world. We have very few speakers left. And so teaching Machif, even though I'm a second language learner myself, is part of what one has to do in language revitalization. Survivors in the Northwest Territories are calling for intergenerational healing from the trauma of residential schools. And in a small South slave community, that reconciliation may come in the form of a demolition. Here's Charlotte Moore Jacobs with that story. Connie Benwell has never met her uncle Marvin. That's because he never returned home from residential school. She keeps him and other family members in her heart, though, helping organize local walks for survivors and their families. With all the, you know, the uh, graves being found, the unmarked graves being found, it just makes it more prevalent and um, just plays on your mind. Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, population 1600, mostly Dene, Cree, and Métis. But this quaint community has a dark past. Joseph Burr Tyrell Elementary School, Paul William Kayser High School, and Brennett Hall all served as buildings for residential schools from the 1950s to the mid-1970s. As residential schools closed, the government sold the buildings or gave them back to the communities to be used as band offices and administrative facilities. 
or they simply left them as is. Here at Fort Smith, three of those buildings remain and are actively being used as educational facilities. But many survivors here say they want to see those buildings demolished. Fort Smith is um, still grieving from it. And I think once those buildings are torn down and we can see uh, new buildings, then maybe new life will come into Fort Smith. But right now, it just it's almost seems like there's this big old black cloud just hanging over it. It's not right. It's not okay to have those residential schools still standing and still being used. This past National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, Benwell stood with other residential school survivors and wellness workers, like Brenda Shalafu. Until we understand and comprehend the truth and take ownership, then it's harder to start reconciling. Shalafu says when Indigenous people experience trauma, part of their spirit leaves their body. I have three granddaughters who are in the elementary school. My children went through the school system and I have had family members who stayed at Brainerd Hall. And so I know it's in the works and it's been mentioned in the Legislative Assembly already, but um, we need to have ceremony as Indigenous people to call our spirits back and to have family members who have passed on, to have the younger generation call their spirits back so that we can finally rest. And the South Slave School Division, based in town, says they are engaging with community members on options. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Fort Smith. Time for a quick break. Still to come, we'll have the story of an MMA gym in Listagouche and see how a Cree entrepreneur in Alberta is cooking up a new career. Stay with us. Welcome back. An on-reserve mixed martial arts gym in eastern Quebec is celebrating its 11th year running this month. Amelia Fournier spoke with the owner, Mi'kmaq Dwayne Ward, about his journey and what it takes to fight. This, 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 this. As First Nations also, we are natural born warriors. We have warrior blood in our DNA. Standing at five foot 10, okay. weighing in at 262 pounds, Dwayne Ward stays ready for combat. This. Nearing 50 years old, he's still going strong. I love to train. I don't train just for fights. I, tr I fought before. I, my last fight was in 2015. It's now 2023. I'm still training, you know what I mean? Because I love this testing myself, challenging myself, getting myself ready, you know what I mean? Uh, keeping my blade sharp. He runs the vault out of his home in the Mi'kmaq community of Listigush. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight for a class of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at the vault. It's a mixed martial arts gym that draws in around 100 people from his community and neighboring French, English and First Nations communities. I push off my leg and I go over his shoulder. Once I do this, I twitch my grip, thumbs up. Ward has been practicing jiu-jitsu, boxing and MMA since age 38. And then I just push his wrist back. Boom, for tap. His fighting has led him to winning two fights and jiu-jitsu tournaments and to doing security for UFC fighters. But before that, he fought an inner battle. I was a very bad alcoholic, very bad drug addict, uh, life of crime, getting in trouble with the law all the time, getting in trouble with girlfriends, getting in trouble with family, everybody around me all the time. And uh, my life was going downhill. At 25, he went to rehab. He says his sobriety is what's allowed him to keep up with the young fighters at his gym. I don't come down from booze. I don't come down from drugs. I'm always, you know, all I need is a cup of coffee and play some Metallica tunes and I'm ready to go, you know what I mean? He drew on his experience as an addictions counselor and youth intervention worker. Underhook, back a tricep. Underhook, back a tricep. Let's go. And now he helps people by coaching kids and adults from all walks of life. MMA is up here too. It's not just physical. It's not being able to beat a person or kick a person or do jujitsu or whatever on a person. Uh, it's also, it, so many people have come to me and told me, Dwayne, I was, I was uh, suicidal. 
Dwayne, I couldn't go out of the house and talk to people. Dwayne, I didn't socialize with people. Dwayne, I couldn't, uh, I had mental health problems. After class, I don't feel those things. He says MMA also teaches discipline. To win fights, you need to work hard. It's all about doing your homework first. I always tell people you got to do uh, your cardio, you got to do your sparring, you got to do your pad work, you got to do your bag work, you got to do your um, everything that it takes. Hit kick. Good. One more. Ward says MMA is a great outlet for everyone. I say I can go hit a person, uh, they hit me, and I don't get charged at the end of it, and we shake hands. You know what I mean? Like, like, what other better kind of profession that you can get into that if you've got that violent side, that um, alpha, uh, alpha side in you, that's um, uh, you train hard, you, you've got that um, aggressiveness in you that you need to get out, this is a perfect place for, um, to take that aggression out. You go under, you grab his hips, boom. Emilia Fournier, APTN so National News, Lustigush, Quebec. Inspirational story that Dwayne has. Well, a Cree entrepreneur in Edmonton has made her love of cooking food into a full-time business. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to Kim, the owner of Kim's Creations. So we're just going to mix this up, and then we're going to mix it. We're going to make it into balls there. Kimberly Yellowney has a long history of it cooking. After watching and helping her cook him as a child, that began her love of cooking for others. She was the one who at family dinners and gatherings would always be in the kitchen all day. A year ago, she started her own catering business, Kim's Creations. It wasn't easy at first. I didn't feel like I was getting enough momentum just doing the, just doing the weekly menus and just putting on Facebook and the Instagram posts. So I started commenting on other things too, on other people's businesses and doing this and that, like more networking, I guess, on social media. And then I started doing the farmer's markets, getting my name out there. Um, I just actually got an honorary nomination from the Southwest Farmer's Market. Now, business is good. She will be needing help for the upcoming holidays. Like her cook'em, she doesn't measure. It's just the amounts that feel right and putting positive energy into what she does. I'll smudge and I'll meditate before I start cooking because in this way I got my positive energy into there and I put in my love into my cooking and I put in my loving energies into it and I think good thoughts about and what I'm grateful for while I'm cooking. It's already starting to smell good. She says there are dishes that people are crazy about. My meatballs, my meatloaf and stuff a lot of people love. Um, and then my chicken meatballs is like one of my top fav like favorites and a lot of people are raving about it. So, and then my bannock, a lot of people love my bannock and the different flavors that I provide because I'm trying to come up with different flavors each month. This reporter gives it high marks. The chicken meatballs and cinnamon bannock were amazing and filling. I love cooking. I love feeding people and having gatherings and I believe food is family because it brings your family together. And it's a t t togetherness, you know, you share this awesome meal together and everybody, who doesn't like <laughs> to have a good meal? You can order dishes on Kim's Creations social media pages. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Sherwood Park, Alberta. That's all the time we have. I'm Dennis Ward. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.